Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space News with me. If you're new here, then every single Monday, I post these videos containing all the latest and greatest updates regarding SpaceX's Starship development, all of the most interesting launch events from the past week, and everything else regarding space, spaceflight, and all that good stuff. So much to talk about today, from static fire madness at Boca Chica Starbase, orbital launches from across the world, and an imminent SLS launch on the cards. This video was sponsored by Squarespace, the ultimate tool in website creation. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's talk about Starship. What a jam-packed week it has been for Starbase watchers. We've been absolutely spoiled for spectacular Starship spin prime and static fire tests. Let's begin with Booster 7. It stood on the orbital launch mount with just its 20 outer Raptor 2 engines. The inner 13 engines were removed in the Mega Bay following the explosive end to Booster 7's spin prime test on the 11th of July. Wait, really? This was a month ago? Hmm. Time flies, I guess. <laughs> anyway, back to the present day now. The week started off with some successful spin prime testing of the booster. We also saw this for Ship 24 as well. I should probably quickly clarify what a spin prime test is for those that don't know. A spin prime test doesn't involve ignition. It's basically a test that involves the spin up of the engine's turbo pumps. So while it's exciting to see Booster 7 and Ship 24 complete these tests successfully, it's the static fires that are the really exciting ones to see. And then it finally happened. Look at this official SpaceX photo. This is, obviously, a static fire test of a single Raptor 2 engine on Booster 7. Lab Partray caught this amazing video footage as well. This is a big milestone. It's the first static fire to take place on the orbital launch mount and for Booster 7. In fact, this is the first ever Raptor 2 static fire for the whole of Starbase. SpaceX weren't done there though. The next day we saw another static fire, this time lasting for a duration of 20 seconds, again with just one Raptor 2 engine. Thanks to a tweet from Elon Musk, we know that the purpose of this static fire was to test the booster's autogenous pressurization system. After this, the booster was crane lifted off the launch pad. Why the crane? Well, the chopsticks at the time were still out of action after the hydraulic failure that we saw on the 6th of August. Happily, this now appears to have been resolved, or at least is approaching completion, as we saw the first sign of mobility testing on Saturday, which you can see in this time-lapse shot. Anyway, we're now waiting for SpaceX to add the 13 Raptor 2 engines to Booster 7 in the Mega Bay before rolling it out again for hopefully a full 33 engine static fire. That's gonna be one heck of a sight to see. Elon shared this video of crews adding the inner 13 engines. It wasn't just Booster 7 that roared last week. Just hours after the Booster 7 static fire, we saw a two engine static fire from Ship 24. We got some amazing shots from around the site, including one from the official SpaceX Twitter account. Yep, it's really Warp 9 pace down at Boca Chica right now. Hear those Raptor 2 engines roar. SpaceX paid a lot of good money for these bad boys, so it's good to see them finally flex them flames. SpaceX, being a private company, doesn't have to disclose how much its Raptor 2 engines cost. Right now, they probably cost a lot, factoring in things like R&D, we're probably looking at seven figures at least. Though with mass production, these numbers should drop dramatically. SpaceX eventually hoped to get the price down to less than $250,000, at a production rate of 500 engines per year. That is still $125 million per year though, and I don't know if I can give any advice to SpaceX on how to save costs even further. But what I can tell you is how to save money on Squarespace, who have sponsored today's episode of Space This Week and are offering all of you 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using my code MATLAU. If you've been living under a rock, then let me break it down for you. You need a website. It's current year after all. If you're a small business owner, musician, artist, designer, heck, anyone who's trying to make a name for themselves these days, then a professional and well-designed website is a must. But that doesn't mean hiring a team of designers and software engineers, far from it. Just make a free account with Squarespace, tell them the sort of site you need, pick a template from a massive list of pre-designed layouts, and then get going. The templates are really just a springboard for your creativity. You can change anything and everything about them to make the perfect website for your needs. It's super simple. In the background here, you can see me making a website about me being a kayak tour operator. Because why not? If the whole YouTube and healthcare careers fall through, then I can see myself hitting the water, and I would need a website if I were to sail down that path. So go on. 
Get creating your online masterpiece today for free on squarespace.com and then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash matlown to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Go on, do it now. There has never been a better time. Down at Starbase Kennedy, we saw section number six of the Starship Orbital Launch Tower rolled out and later stacked. And you can really see how this thing is already now dwarfing the Falcon 9 launch tower, and we've still got three more tower segments to go. Back at Starbase Boca Chica, last week I briefly covered the story of crews beginning to paint the Starlink V2 payload loader building white in order to help reflect the heat of the Texan sun, and last week it looked like all of this was completed. So much is being achieved with the Starship program. Looking back to just over a year ago seems pretty crazy. We had the full stack of Booster 4 and Ship 20, and lots of people admittedly myself included, were expected to see the orbital launch happen by like late summer, early autumn. It would absolutely be happening before the launch of SLS at least, that was clear. But then weeks became months, Booster 4 and Ship 20 were retired, and now here we are, still seeing the early testing campaigns of Ship 24 and Booster 7. And now, out of nowhere, Artemis 1 is about to roll out with a launch date in just two weeks. NASA already has the live stream up on YouTube. I'll stick a link in the description for you to click on and add this to your watch later playlist and whatnot. And hey, while you're down there, if you are enjoying this video so far, then don't forget to leave a like down below and subscribe as well so you never miss these videos. I always do appreciate it and it really helps support my channel. The Artemis 1 launch is going to be epic. And you know, part of me is kind of happy for NASA that they'll be beating Starship to orbit because they can at least claim that they have the most powerful operational rockets, which they can hold on to until Starship becomes operational. The launch of SLS is going to be an epic one. The live stream should be really, really good as well. The core stage has eight cameras on it, and the Orion capsule has a ton of cameras on board as well. And even if the live stream ends up glitching or stuttering or whatnot, the onboard footage is going to be downlinked after stage separation, so we should still have some great recordings of the launch after it's all happened. SpaceX launched two Falcon 9s last week. The first launch took place on the 10th of August at the Kennedy Space Center. This was Starlink Mission Group 426, and the Falcon placed 52 satellites into shell number 4, with the first stage making a successful touchdown on the autonomous drone ship. The second Falcon 9 launch took place on Friday. SpaceX launched the Falcon 9 from the Vandenberg Space Launch Center. This was the third Starlink launch to shell number 3, and inside the payload fairing were 46 Starlink satellites. This marks the 54th operational Starlink mission, and it leaves the total number of Starlink satellites launched to a staggering 3,055 of which around 2,796 remain in orbit. With the success of last week's mission, SpaceX will need roughly 10 more launches in order to fill the rest of Starlink Shell 3, which is in an orbit of 97.6 degrees at an altitude of 560 kilometers, which will consist of 348 Starlink satellites. Though, it'll probably be a while before we see it completed. According to a statement from Gwyn Shotwell back in April last year, Shell 3 is the lowest priority shell, and SpaceX expects it to be the last to be filled. As for the Falcon 9 first stage, that successfully touched down 635 kilometers downrange from the launch pad on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, netting another double figures for SpaceX. This booster has now launched and landed a total of 10 times, having previously supported a whole host of missions for SpaceX, including the Crew-1 and Crew-2 missions. Many thanks to Rooklan here for her great diagram showing the life of this booster so far. Speaking of Falcon 9 launch news, in late August, SpaceX will be launching Starlink Group 420 on Booster 1069, which is very nice. As you can see, this is the weed number, and it's also the sex number, which is very funny and very cool. I can assure you that I will be contacting SpaceX to ensure that the launch coverage looks something like this. Three, two, one, zero. It's your Wow, that was a blast back to 2013. Anyway, on Tuesday, we saw a couple of orbital rocket launches. The day kicked off at just gone 4am universal time when Chinese firm Galactic Energy successfully pulled off the third consecutive launch for their solid-fueled rocket Ceres-1, which launched from the Chiquan launch site carrying three satellites to low Earth orbit. The payloads were the Taijing-101 and 02 satellites, which are Earth observation satellites developed by Minospace, a Chinese commercial space startup. These two satellites will be used 
successful remote sensing observation missions and can provide customers with a full range of remote sensing imaging services. The third satellite launch was the Donghai 1. Now, not a great deal of information has been disclosed about this one, but official sources have stated that it'll be used to verify the multi-mode remote sensing technology of its polarization camera. About two hours after the launch of Ceres 1, a Roscosmos operated Soyuz 2.1B Fregat rocket blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, which you can see here in this totally unedited and politically neutral footage. The primary payload for this mission was the Iranian KM Earth Remote Sensing Satellite, which was successfully delivered to low Earth orbit, marking a milestone event in Russian-Iran cooperation, according to Roscosmos chief Yuri Borisov. The rocket also carried 16 Russian-built nanosatellites created by Russia's leading universities, businesses, and non-profit organizations. These satellites are for a range of uses. Among them are four Earth observation satellites, four technology demonstration platforms, two satellites are for navigation, and two are for scientific research, and one is to further research into space farming. I am now going to talk about Astra's Rocket 3. Now, this ill-fated rocket has had a tough old time since its inception. Of its seven launches, only two have successfully reached orbit. Among the launch failures was its most recent mission back on the 12th of June, which carried two NASA Tropics CubeSats, which were both lost after the second stage ran out of fuel too early. In Astra's release of their second quarter earnings this year, they announced that they would be permanently shelving Rocket 3 in favor of their upcoming Rocket 4, which is a much bigger rocket with a higher payload capacity, capable of carrying up to 600 kilogram satellites to mid-inclination low Earth orbit, with a base bulk launch price for dedicated launches expected to remain under $5 million, which is still pretty cheap as far as orbital launches go. And hopefully this rocket has a more successful career than the ill-fated Rocket 3. As of right now, it's unlikely that Rocket 4 will be ready to fly customers until 2024, though I am looking forward to seeing if Astra can pull this one off. One thing that leaves me curious about this ordeal is the fate of Rocket 5. Now, this was announced by Astra back in September 2020, and it's supposed to be a suborbital variant of Rocket 3, designed for point-to-point -point launches, a bit like SpaceX's Earth-to-Earth -Earth concept for Starship. Though, obviously, this will be inanimate payload, most likely for military purposes. I'm going to go ahead and assume that Rocket 5 has been scrapped along with Rocket 3, but, uh, yeah, interesting bit of trivia, I thought. Now, I love this aircraft. This is NASA's Super Guppy, and has been used by NASA since the Apollo era, where it was used to carry the complete third stage of the Saturn V rocket, as well as other oversized payloads like the Apollo Command Module. And it's still in active use to this day, being the only one of the five originally built to still be flying. NASA has been using this plane recently to move the Orion capsule around the country while it was undergoing fabrication and testing. And last week on Wednesday, the plane arrived at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, with the Orion Stage Adapter Structural Test Article. This structure connects the SLS rocket's interim cryogenic propulsion stage to the Orion spacecraft. I just like the opportunity of showing off weird wings from time to time, and the Super Guppy is definitely a cool vehicle to showcase and a great piece of spaceflight history. Now, I would like to give a massive thanks to all the names on screen, my Patreon and channel members. With your support, I can continue making these space news videos, so I am so grateful to each and every one of you. If you want to join this list, then hit the buttons either below the video or on screen right now, but otherwise, there are two video suggestions from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like up there. Hopefully, they're good picks. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.